Well, good morning. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be with you this morning. I've been looking forward to this for two years. But I do want to tell you that even though I've two years to prepare, and Jay has reminded me of that on uh, many occasions, it wouldn't make any difference with me if I had 20 years. To do justice to this topic is a major undertaking. Because as Jordan said, the first memory we have are those of our mother. A mother. With that motherhood, we understand and we feel this love and this compassion. We uh, have the love and nurture of our mother. How could we ever not love our mother? And how could we not ever respect her? So I want to tell you this morning that we cannot overstate the importance of motherhood. I'm here to tell you that motherhood is the primary responsibility that you have as a godly woman. And that as you are raising your children, I hope and pray that you can fear God and that you can uh, live up to that. We live in a society where motherhood is disdained and brought with reproach. You think about it. We live in a society of crumbling morals. Without godly mothers, what will we have? Without godly mothers, we have no future. Without godly mothers, we have no future in the church. We have no future in society. We have no future as individuals. So today, as we talk about mothers who fear the Lord, I want you to take it to your heart, this awesome responsibility of motherhood and the awesome responsibility of fearing God. Proverbs 31 teaches us some attributes about a virtuous woman. Solomon writes, who can find a virtuous woman because her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Proverbs 31 does not tell us what to do and tell you what to do to become this woman. But what it does do is give you the attributes and the responsibilities if you will become this godly mother who fears the Lord. It's the descriptions of a woman that has the attributes of godliness flowing from her. I believe I'm talking to an audience this morning filled with women and men. But the women that are here today, there are all different age groups, isn't there? There's older women and there's younger women. As we talk to the older women, we want to praise you and uh, give you applause in so many ways in our heart and in our minds for the good job that you've done as a godly mother. For the young ladies who are stepping into motherhood, we want to encourage you. We want to encourage you to be that godly mother that will change society, change your home, and change the church. Solomon says this woman is valued higher than rubies. Now that is not to say that it's impossible to find such a woman. I believe we see them every day in our churches. And I am so thankful for those godly mothers who have given their life to the rearing of their children and to the blessing of other people, of teaching them the ways of God and teaching them Jesus Christ and the gospel. The scripture says this woman is worthy of praise. We want to do that today. I want to praise you as a godly mother. And I want to exhort you to become that godly mother and that woman who fears the Lord. Nothing we can say here today will overstate the importance of a mother who fears the Lord. This is the heart of the matter according to verse 31. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Give her the fruit of her hands. And I want to ask you this morning as we begin our thoughts about the responsibilities and about the challenges that you face. I want to ask you, what, are the, what is the work that you're doing as a godly mother? You're professing godliness or you wouldn't even be here today. What is the work you're doing? And will the work of your hands offer you praise? 
for what you're doing. Our goal today is not to cast guilt, but rather to encourage our mothers who fear the Lord. I believe that all of us are in the same boat, so to speak. I believe that we all have all experienced failures in our life. And I don't believe there's a mother that's here today that can look back at her life and say, I've done everything perfect. You haven't done that. And as a father, I certainly haven't done everything perfect with my children. And my wife, as a mother, has not done everything perfect in her life. I'm not here to try to cast a stone at you and to try to make you feel guilty for what you haven't done. I do want to encourage you, and I want to give you some thoughts that will benefit you down the road as you're raising your children. And these girls that are here today who have not mothers, maybe we have some that are teenagers here. I can remember just a short while ago, Jordan was in a study with us out at Plainview, and he was just a little old bitty whippersnapper. And look at him now. He's emceeing. He is a grown man with a wife. He's developing a family. This is going to be the case for every young person here today. Your life is not going to stay where you are. You're going to change. You're going to grow. And you're going to develop. I want to ask you, do you want to develop serving God? Sure you do. And that's the blessing of Christianity, is our growth and our development of who we're going to become. Every mother that's here today, your goal, your responsibility is to become like Jesus Christ, is it not? And you want your children to become like Jesus. You want your children to become of holiness and righteousness. Our society will be changed one person at a time through Jesus Christ and no other way. Our homes are changed through Jesus Christ and no other way. The awesome responsibility of becoming a mother, of being a mother, being a grandmother, it's a responsibility that God has given you. And the question is, will you live up to that responsibility? Will you encourage others to live up to that responsibility? Today, we want to identify these attributes. They are attributes that uh, tend toward responsibility of what she needs to be doing, of how she needs to be living. We want to encourage our mothers to fear the Lord. And that is a key phrase. Not just to become a mother, but a mother who fears God. And there is a big difference. We want to reflect upon her importance and we want to honor the godly mother. Today, motherhood, as I said, has been brought upon with reproach. And it has been downplayed in society to the point that many people are deciding not to become a mother. Many people look down upon mothers who stay at home or who are uh, uh, associating themselves entirely with rearing their children and that's the number one goal. That's the society we face. That's when we leave this building and we go out into the world and we go out into the workplace, we're facing a society that looks down upon godly mothers. Women of old, however, understood the importance of motherhood. In Genesis 20 verse 1, when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. Now I want you to think about that. She said, give me a child or I'm just going to die. That's how she revered motherhood. She wanted children so badly that she felt like that if she didn't have a child, she was going to die. And if God has blessed you with children today, it is indeed a blessing. Rachel understood that. However, giving birth to a child in itself does not make a woman a godly mother who fears the Lord. We see today many women who have uh, given birth to a child, but that does not make them a godly mother. And it certainly doesn't make them one who fears God. What do we mean when we say fearing the Lord? The word feareth comes from a word Yahweh, and it means morally reverent. The mother who fears the Lord is morally and spiritually reverent. 
Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Of being morally and spiritually reverent. If I hold God up as God, if I esteem him as God instead of myself, that's what it means to become fearing the Lord. Today, we have a world that wants to hold up everything else as God except Jesus. And what a shame it is when we have mothers who do not fear God and want to hold up everything else as reverent and as holy, but God alone is holy. And to be morally reverent then and to fear God is to be spiritually reverent. When we bow our knee, we're bowing our knee to a almighty God, the maker of all things, the Lord of lords. A mother who fears the Lord then becomes this reverent person. She sees her life as one that is involved in serving God. She sees her life as one that will become moral in all things. That her life becomes one of of absolute truth. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And then she looks at her child and she teaches that child that. A moral reverence, a mother who fears the Lord is reverent in her service to God. One of the responsibilities that you have as a mother is to be a teacher. I don't know any mother yet that is not a teacher. However, I do know some mothers and I have experienced mothers that are not necessarily teachers of good things. As a mother then, you become necessary for you to be a teacher of good things. Notice in Titus 2 and 3, the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. What does that mean, teachers of good things? She is a teacher of right. You know, there is a difference between right and wrong. I know today in, in our society that the lines are blurred as to what is right and wrong. People are having more difficult time uh, associating themselves and determining what is right and wrong. But the scripture teaches us plainly of what is right and what is wrong. And this mother then becomes a teacher of right. I'm just going to stay here because the microphone's going to scare you. And we don't want to do that. I saw Ty jump. So I'll stay here. A teacher of good things. What good things? What does he mean by good things? What are you teaching your children? Are you teaching them love? Compassion? Mercy? All of those are good things. Are you teaching them long-suffering and patience? To be virtuous? All of those are good things. And we can see those as good things, but you know, there are many good things that a mother needs to be teaching her children. I'll tell you, we live in a world today where children need to be taught manners. How to act, how to behave, how to respect older people. She is a teacher of good things, this mother. A mother who fears God is teaching her child about Jesus. A teacher of good things. Can you think of anything better to teach your child than about the Lord? A teacher of good things. A teacher of right. I exhort you today as a mother who fears the Lord to be a teacher of good things. To understand that there is right and there is wrong. Our society has tried to blur that line to the point that mothers are afraid to teach their children. Let's not become that mother. Let's not become that person that says, I don't know what's right. We do know what's right. We need to be a teacher of good things. 
One of the responsibilities you have as a mother who fears the Lord, and an attribute of this mother is found in Titus 2 and 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober. Sobriety. This is taught. And what that literally means is to make sound mind. We live in a world today where soundness of mind is not experienced too often, is it? We've gone through terrible times where we look and we see the insanity of things. A child is taught to think sanely. But it's not just sane thinking and it's not just this clear demarcation, if you will, of right and wrong and seeing that. But it's more of discipline and correction. A mother who fears the Lord is not afraid to exercise discipline. Now listen to me before you go off and say, Mark's uh, encouraging you to beat your child. I'm not talking about disciplining your child. I'm talking about disciplining you. Exercising discipline in your own life and teaching then a child to exercise discipline in their life. When we see mothers that are more concerned about themselves than they are their own child and the spiritual welfare of that child, you can say they're not sober. It's not sound mind. I want to ask you today, mothers, if you lose your child eternally and they gain this whole world, what will you have? Sobriety, discipline, correction. We live in a world today where everything is turned upside down. The things of real value are marked down really cheap. And you can get those things real easy. It just means exercising discipline and correction. It means that you have to say no to some things. Do you love your child enough to say no? We see in this world things that are really cheap and worthless marked very expensive. And they cost you everything. They'll cost you all of your time and all of your life at the cost of your child. Denial of oneself and self-correction is not a natural carnal attribute. That's why it has to be taught. I've raised two daughters. Uh, I've supported my wife in raising two daughters. <laughs> and my daughters are no different than anybody else's daughters when they were little and even when they get older. They know what they want. They think they do. They know when they want it. They think they do. And they think they know how to get it. And if we're not careful, these children of ours, these precious children will overtake. And they'll start buying the stuff of this world that is very, very expensive and costs them everything. And they spend their entire life trying to get the things of this world. That is taught. I want to tell you here this morning, that is taught. When we're talking about teaching sobriety, you are teaching your children how to live. What they are to seek after. If you're placing everything above your, the spiritual needs of your child, you're not teaching them sobriety. I know you want success for your child. So do I. But understand that if they gain everything of this world and they lose their soul, they've lost everything. And as a godly mother who fears the Lord, teach sobriety. Teach control. Teach reverence to God. Teach priorities. Teach these things that are going to lead them to heaven. 
And a godly mother who fears the Lord, she reverences God. She sees him as supreme and not anything else. And she glorifies him. She glorifies him with her children. Listen to the words of Jesus in Luke 9 verse 23. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, the flesh cries for satisfaction. Here's the dilemma we face. Our flesh cries for soothing. We try to give it to it. It, try, it cries for uh, comfort. We try to give it. Our child cries for the things of the flesh, and we try to give it. Jesus said that if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. That is words of sobriety. To exercise discipline to say no. No to the flesh. And our children have to hear that word. No. The carnal mind pleads a case for itself. And if we're not careful, that case will win in the court. The battle for those who would reverence God then is to deny oneself. A godly mother who fears the Lord, her responsibility is to teach sobriety, but also to teach uh, the younger women to love their husbands. Now, I'm not going to belabor this point. David Earl's going to take care of this, I'm sure, in just a few minutes. But I do want to make mention because every godly mother, uh, she needs to learn these things too. And this is her responsibility, to love her husband. This word, uh, loving their husband, comes from the Greek word philandros, and it means loving friend. It means a special affection for her lifetime mate. Embracing him as her calling from God. The decision of love then can be taught. Put it this way. A one man woman. She has eyes for no one else. Teach your children that. That's sobriety but it's also exercising this command of loving your husband. Love demonstrates faithfulness. The mother who fears the Lord will teach her children faithfulness. She will teach her daughters faithfulness. She will teach her sons faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 7 and 2 puts it this way. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Faithfulness. Satan is attacking the home in every way that he can. And number one, he tries to get us together before we're married. And after we're married, he tries to get us apart. God teaches faithfulness. One man, one woman. A one man woman. Teach your daughters that. Teach your sons faithfulness. Titus 2 and 4 also says that they may teach the young women to love her children. Now I have to confess, uh, some of these points that I'm talking about today have come from talking to older women in the church, people that I respect greatly. And every one of them comes and tells me the same thing. Every time I ask the question, the same answer is the same. It is absolutely amazing to hear these older women that have, are at the end of their life and they've raised their children and then you ask them, why do you think that Paul gives a command to teach a woman to love her children? Now, I'm a cornfield preacher, I guess. I've got some cows at home, and I hear an old mama cow bellowing for the baby calf. She wants to take care of that baby calf. And I've seen some cows that if you stepped in the pasture with that baby calf, your life is at stake. 
And after the calf gets bigger and everything, it's fine. The, calf, the mama's fine. She's just as peaceful, just as gentle. You can go up and rub her, whatever you want to do. But when that calf is little, that old mama cow cares about that calf. You just watch nature. You watch the bird, the mama bird, spend her entire day flying back and forth to feed that baby chick in the nest. That's nature. So I ask these older women, why would we have to be taught to love our child? Have you considered that? The answer is the same. And it's summed up in these words. Some don't and some won't. Sadly, that's true. Because this love of loving her child is a decision. Because the baby bird is in the nest and the mama spends all of her energy trying to take care of that baby bird, flying back and forth, we would never call that love. We would call that instinct and an act of nature. That mama, cow that bellows after her calf, we would never call that love. We would call that nature that God placed that in that old mama cow. And just the simple fact of you having a child and you taking care of that child physically and making sure that child doesn't starve to death and that it has fine clothes and then as that child grows, you want to make sure that child gets the best schooling and then when that child gets that best schooling, and you may send them to Harvard, you may send them to an Ivy League school, you may send them to Oxford in England, wherever, it doesn't matter. That's not the love he's talking about. Some don't, and some won't. And the reason why they won't is because they are so carried up in this world and the things of this world that when it comes to their child, that's all they can see. And your child may become very successful in this life. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having a good job. There's nothing wrong with having a great education. I'm all for it. But that's not the love he's talking about. The love he's talking about is the love for the soul of that child. For the care of that child in every way of their salvation. And today, that's what I want to, you to leave here with from this speech. If you're going to love your child, you're going to have to care about their soul. First and foremost, Today, we see things like this. We're inundated by it. My body, my choice. My body, my decision. My mind, my body, my choice. Have you noticed that there's a common thread in all of these? My body. And somehow this society turned upside down has gotten the idea that they could take and get rid of a baby as if it's no more than a fingernail. And then say they love their children. I have a picture here of a singer. She was very popular when I was a teenager and this dates me. She was very popular and I enjoyed her music and I'm not going to tell you I didn't. I was a teenager and I enjoy some of her songs now. They're all on the classic uh, radio stations right now. Her name is Stevie Nicks. I didn't say this, she said this. And I'm not trying to cast a stone at her and I'm not trying to cast a stone at you. I'm trying to show you the difference between loving your child and loving their soul. Stevie Nicks says, if I hadn't ended my pregnancy, I'm pretty sure there would have been no Fleetwood Mac. Wow. 
What would we ever do without Fleetwood Mac? How would we ever make it? What Stevie Nicks is really saying there is if my hundred million dollar a year career would have never happened. That's what she's really saying. She's not really caring about your welfare. She's saying if I had not gotten rid of my baby and furthered my career... I wouldn't be worth a hundred million dollars right now. Now whether it's a hundred million dollars or a thirty thousand dollar a year job, it's still the same. If you're going to put your career over your child and the salvation of your child, you're no different. Yes, indeed, we can see very easily how terrible this is. And I, I believe I'm talking to women today that would never think about aborting their child. Perhaps I'm talking to someone here today who has been guilty of that. I want to tell you that we serve a God who can forgive you. You have not gone past Jesus Christ, his love, his compassion, and his grace. And we're not trying to cast a stone at you. We want you to know the Lord. And we want you to raise your child to serve God. If we're struggling in our churches anywhere, it's because we're failing in this. We'll put everything above service to God if we're not careful. Because the flesh cries for satisfaction and it wars against the spirit. And the Apostle Paul says that the carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. If we're not careful, we will let a $30,000 a year job take us away from the church. If we're not careful, we'll let a ball game take us away from the church. I've seen it done. Or any other thing. So I'm not trying to condemn Stevie Nicks, and I'm not trying to condemn you. I want you to know that Jesus can save. And I want you to know that Jesus can change your life. But I want you also to know that unless your child knows Jesus, nothing's going to change. They'll still strive for the things of this world and still come up empty and in failure. So I want to ask you this morning, mothers, and to be mothers, you're going to love your child? You're going to love their soul? You can make that decision. We And the older women need to be teaching the younger women this very thing. According to the Apostle Paul, it's a command for the older women to teach these younger women these things. Love your children. Love their soul. Say no. Is this loving your child? To adopt an immodest lifestyle? How many will send their children out into the world to be seen of the world? We think that our child, because we love them so much, and I understand it, I've experienced it. They deserve to be the center of the universe. Immodesty is not simply a lascivious dress. It can be. But if I'm teaching my child to become the center of the universe and that they need all the attention and that life is all about them, I'm teaching them to be immodest. And if I'm teaching them that, then they are taking their eyes off God and they will not glorify him. They will glorify themselves. Are we setting an example for our child? For those around about us? If you're a godly mother who fears the Lord, set an example. We face today so many things that have an appearance of evil. And if our children see us, 
setting an appearance of evil, they too will adopt it. And communication. A godly mother is going to communicate with her child. She's going to make sure that they know about the Lord in every way that they can possibly do it. Now, I'm not here to tell you that you have to be a perfect teacher. You can't be. And there are things that you're going to stumble and fall in. We all do. But brethren, we have to try. This is our children we're talking about. And it's not just our children today, but it's the children of tomorrow. And the next day. And the next day. We're growing up in a world and we're living in a world where communication with our child is somehow distant and distracted by all of the things of the world. Yes, you and I may very well see the fallacy of abortion and can see how that's not loving your child to commit that atrocity. But what about this atrocity? To raise your child to become immoral and immodest so that they might receive attention from those around about them. Proverbs 31 and 28 says, Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. The children rise up and call her blessed. 2 Timothy 1 and 5 says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in thee also. Now, Paul is talking to Timothy. And Timothy was taught by his grandmother and his mother. He received faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if you're not communicating with your child the word of God, uh, it's most likely they're going to be lacking in their faith. If you're here today and you've had a godly mother or you are, have one now, you have a lot to be thankful for. If you're here today and you've not had a godly mother, you've had a lot to overcome. And you're still trying to overcome it. When Paul takes note of Lois and Eunice, I want you to take note of something. He did not applaud Lois and Eunice for being beautiful women. They might have very well been. I don't know. But he didn't applaud them for that. He didn't applaud them for going out into the world and have every hair in place. He didn't applaud them for that. He didn't applaud them for being a CEO of some company or running a magnificent business. He didn't applaud them for that. In this world today, we want to applaud our children for being a movie star and they're not even in the movies. But this grandmother and mother were not applauded for any of those things. They were applauded for teaching their son. Now, this gives me hope. My, my, my wife is now a grandmother. We are grandparents of six and soon to be seven. Boy, I am thankful I get opportunity to help change that future generation as a grandparent. And I'm thankful that Paul took note of this grandmother to Timothy. Because that tells me it's not an ending job. And as a grandparent, you have that responsibility to your grandchildren too. And you can enact a change in their life for good. And the children rise up and call her blessed. How many of us today praise our mother and our grandmother for the things that they've done in our life and the changes that they've made in our life through their love and compassion and their teaching. Where would you be today if your mother had not taught you about Jesus? Jesus. 
This faith that was in Timothy was a faith that had been imparted to him. And you can impart faith to your child too. By giving them and sharing with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And without a godly mother, you and I are very near being a heathen. Where would we be? The wise man says in Proverbs 6 and 20, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. <laughs> this law of the mother then becomes the word of God. It's the only law that is stable. It's the only law that doesn't change. It is a mandate from God that never changes. And so Proverbs says, keep this commandment and keep this law. Because it doesn't change. The poet says mothers hold their children's hand for a short while, but their hearts forever. How true. I am 65 years old. My mother's been dead since 2010. I watched her pass into the next life. While she was nearing the end of her life, She took her finger and she put it in my face. <laughs> and she said, I'll stick with you. I'll stick with you. And she did. What she was telling me is that she was not through being a mother. Don't stop being a mother. Mothers hold their children's hand for a short while, but their hearts they hold forever. My mother still holds my heart. I'm thankful for the mother that I had. I'm thankful for the grand blessing of having that mother. She was not perfect. She was not inspired. But she taught me. And I'm here today, standing before this audience today, talking about mothers because of what she taught me. And the example that she lived in her life. You live that example for your child. We need mothers that will dedicate their children. An example of dedication to their children is given in the Old Testament with a woman by the name of Hannah. Hannah prayed for a child. The scripture says she prayed for this child. I, I, I imagine that there's many women in this audience today that prayed for their child. Lord, give me a child. You prayed. Hannah not only prayed for her child, but then she dedicated her child. Dedicated her child to the service of the Lord. Why can't we do that? You can do that. I exhort you to do that. A mother who fears the Lord is going to dedicate her child. Don't dedicate your child to this world. At the end of the day, it's all lost anyway. Dedicate your child to the Lord. To the service of God. As we dedicate our children, then we see our churches flourish and the work of the church. The work of the local church becomes uh, important in every community because they have families. Every congregation that is flourishing right now in our brotherhood is flourishing because they have families that are flourishing. Because families are dedicating their children to the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11 and 12 teaches us that a, man, a woman is of the man, even so is the man also of the woman, but all things are of God. Let's dedicate our marriages. Wife, dedicate your marriage. Husband, dedicate your marriage. Eve comes from Adam, and since, through procreation, every man comes from a woman. You see, we need each other. <laughs> Desperately. Let's dedicate each other. As a godly mother, dedicate your husband also. Teach him. Through your lifestyle, he can be changed. 1 Peter 3 and 1 says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. 
While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, they can be changed. Now, this is not a guarantee. I want to tell you it's not. Sometimes it doesn't happen. I'd like to tell you about a mother that I knew at the end of her life. I didn't know her for long, but I knew her and I heard all the stories about this dear, sweet sister. She married a man that was not a Christian. Not only was he not a Christian, he hated the church. He didn't want anything to do with it. Now, that's the first problem. And she had many troubles in her.